you've probably already, you've actually already been hearing about convection probably all week because it's almost impossible to separate anything in tropical meteorology from convection. But so that made it hard for me to think about what to talk about. But um, I'm just going to go through some of the uh, basic concepts. This is uh, if you look at this at, at satellite imagery, um, it's kind of hard to see the NJL. Although if you look, you probably could. You will see some cyclones, but mostly you just see a lot of uh, you know, convection, a lot of clouds uh, of, of various shapes and sizes. Oh, and you see the, the jets and, and the, the winds that are guiding them along. And so I'm going to try to talk about what's going on on some of the smaller scales here. So um, this is just a, a list of the things that I'll go through, starting with foundational concepts, uh, going through some observations and theory uh, and back to observations. And then at the end, I'll just finish up with a few thoughts on things that we um, are interested in about convection. So the, our thinking of convection probably starts with experiments like uh, Henri Bernard uh, in his um, uh, studies of, of paraffin, where if you heat it from below, you can see this really interesting pattern of overturning motion set up. In this case, they're, they're hexagonal cells. Um, and, and th he got very excited about this. He was in initially doing, a, uh, doing his thesis work on something else. Uh, but when he discovered this happening, he, he got so interested in this, he ended up changing his thesis topic and, and doing it about this. So that, there's a lesson to everybody doing a thesis. Pay attention to what's interesting. And don't be afraid of changing course if, uh, if it looks like that might be worth doing. So um, it turned out later that this is a bit more complicated because the surface tension uh, on the upper surface is very important in controlling uh, why you get these nice hexagons. You don't normally get uh, hexagons like that. But, but you do see in lots of geophysical systems convection, overturning motion with cells, that maybe not regular hexagons, but something quasi-hexagonal. This is um, low clouds over the ocean. And this is uh, just reported in the last couple of weeks. Um, people have concluded that there's convection happening in the ice on Pluto. And you can see these cells here. And there, is, uh, there are ice, uh, liquid uh, H2O icebergs collecting in the subsidence zones of this convective cell, which, where the, the main medium of convection is frozen nitrogen. So um, we can now see convection in, in liquid, gas, and solid phases on different planets in the solar system, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so why does it happen? If you're heating a surface from below and cooling it at the, uh, on the top and you wait, uh, of course, um, almost all sur uh, substances expand when they're heated and become more buoyant. And so they want to rise, and the top stuff wants to sink. And you can get uh, convective uh, cells like this, OK, um, with the hot blobs rising up to the top and the cold stuff coming down. So this is a very uh, sort of simple laminar flow that you might get in a very viscous fluid. Uh, we don't see that exactly in the atmosphere. People who study convection in the lab uh, will look at this thing called the Rayleigh number to decide whether they're going to get convection or not. And it's basically a measure of, of the um, uh, ability to generate buoyancy, uh, but mitigated by the viscosity and also by the ability of the fluid to conduct heat, as opposed to. So there's a competition here between conduction and convection. And uh, this number includes all of those factors. Non-dimensional number uh, increases. It's very sensitive to the distance here, dq, and then the gradient of temperature and, uh, and these coefficients of viscosity and diffusivity in the denominator. If you get very large numbers for Rayleigh number, you'll get uh, convection as opposed to just diffusion. And so in the atmosphere, you get, for any meteorological scale, absolutely enormous Rayleigh numbers. You would have to be looking at the um, diffusion of vapor off of a droplet of water suspended in the atmosphere before you start getting uh, diffusion uh, dominating over convection. So, and yet in, in meteorology, we don't normally talk about this number. Right? So um, uh, when I was at Yale, we were interviewing for geophysicists, and one of the candidates had sort of studied up on, on what people did in the department. He walked into my office and said, so, so I have a question for you, Professor Sherwood. Why, why isn't the atmosphere filled with convection all the time? Because 
it looks to me like the Rayleigh number is always uh, really, really high. Um, and, and that was an interesting question. I, I, I had to you know, give him credit for asking it. That was, we still didn't hire him. But he, he had a, an interesting question. And, and, he, and there's a, the answer is subtle. But I think the um, part of the one way to answer it is to say there is always convection, at least during the daytime. Uh, you, you, the, the Earth develops a boundary layer, and um, and you have convection happening in this boundary layer pretty much anywhere. Um, uh, I flew here yesterday and definitely felt this this convection. Okay, we have up to on, on takeoff and landing, uh, you, you could feel it. And depending on how thick this layer is, you might have a thick cloud layer like the one shown here. Um, there's a certain mixing ratio of water vapor in here, and there's a certain uh, uh, temperature at the surface. And depending on how those things compare, you might reach saturation up here. You might have a broken cloud layer, or you might have nothing. Okay, this, if this layer is shallow, you won't have any condensation. But that doesn't mean that. Uh, but there's still convection going on. So one answer to that question is that there is always convection when when the surface is being heated during the day. And, and over the ocean, you'll find a boundary la layer like this all the time. Over land, um, the boundary layer will often look like this, uh, where you'll have um, uh, some clouds. So these are uh, cumulus mediocris. Over the ocean, you'll have the really small ones that don't have any bases, which are cumulus cumulus. And then if, if, as, as it becomes more humid, you might have an overcast layer. So I'm going to say more about the answer to the, to the Rayleigh number question in a minute. Uh, but then, um, but first, I'm going to ask another question. Why don't these clouds fall down? Why, what, what causes them to stay up there? Most of you probably know this, but I'm just sort of trying to, to cover all the bases here. Um, every cloud particle has a terminal velocity, a terminal fall speed, and uh, if you start, if you put one there, it will fall until until that balances gravity. Okay, so you, until the um, the, the drag force balances gravity, and then it's at its terminal fall speed. And if you work out, if you look at a typical cloud droplet size, uh, which is um, uh, 10 to 20 microns, something like that, the terminal velocities are on the order of uh, 10 centimeters per second. Whereas if you look at the air velocities, the air motions that are, that are involved, they're maybe an order of magnitude larger than that. So therefore, uh, to first approximation, the, the cloud droplets are just carried along, and they don't—they they will eventually settle out if, if, if the uh, turbulence stops, but um, but they don't uh, on these, on the time scales of the actual turbulence. So we see these clouds that sit there as markers of the turbulence under some circumstances. So um, so this turbulence that we have in the boundary layer, you can uh, you can model it. And uh, what I'm showing you here is a paper, uh, a numerical simulation of turbulence in an atmosphere where they've got no water vapor in the atmosphere. And you get something that looks uh, a fair bit like the things I've shown you before. Okay, uh, it's not hexagons, but you get these cells. Uh, you get intense, in this case, uh, upward motions along the boundaries of the cells and a broader sinking motions in the middle of the cells. And, uh, and these are driven by buoyancy. So the warm air is the air that's rising, and the cool air is the air that's sinking. OK, so this is what you get. And, and here is a movie from a group in, in Minnesota, uh, which they're, they're simulating um, convection in a star. All right, But that's not important. What I wanted to show you this for, so ignore this stuff down here. This is something that doesn't have any obvious analog in the atmosphere. But this, uh, this surface layer up here is quite a lot like uh, what you might find in the surface of the Earth. And what I want you to see, they're just coming to it now, uh, is those, those same structures we were just looking at before. You can see here how they evolve in time and how uh, these, these, these lines are kind of convergence zones, where the air is coming in, it's picking up buoyancy as it goes, and finally it, it sinks. Okay? In this case, it's sinking because they're simulating it upside down. The surface of the star is cooling. But it, the, the uh, analogous thing in the atmosphere would be upside down and, and heating the, the lower surface. But that, that phenomenon there is also what we, uh, what we see in the boundary layer. So this is a, another paper that came out at a similar time to that one, 
where they did identical simulations, except that they did one with no water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, and then they did one where they did have water vapor in the atmosphere. And this is the convection that they get. So the top one is the dry case, and it looks kind of like those others. There's a, there's a lot of upward and downward stuff. There's a sort of a short length scale involved. Um, and then when they put water vapor in, totally different. Okay, You have a few places where you have strong upward motion, and then a whole lot of, uh, of places where nothing's happening at all. All right. So, and, and this, this also gets to the uh, question that I was asked about the Rayleigh number. Uh, what he's really asking is, why is it only convecting here when uh, you've got a big Rayleigh number for the whole system? And, um, and it gets down to the definition of what we mean by convection. So if you ask a meteorologist, uh, where's the convection? They would say, oh, it's there and it's there. But if you go back and, and look at the basic, the foundational concept of convection, you would say that this whole thing is convecting, and that the convection just has a very extreme character where the upward motion is concentrated into a small area, and it is, and itself has turbulence embedded within it, which is very interesting. And then uh, the descending patches, which are scattered, scattered around in this case, are occupying most of the area. So you have this descent over a very large area. But this whole thing is actually a big convection cell with a lot of multi-scale uh, activity embedded within it. So we now have, instead of a kind of a dominant single scale, a highly multi-scale, highly turbulent and intermittent behavior, which is what we deal with in the real world. And it's all because it's all the fault of water vapor. If water vapor weren't around, uh, our, our work would have been done many years ago. So maybe it's a good thing we have water vapor because it gives us a job. But it, it makes the system much more interesting and much more complicated. And um, uh, it means that we have to think harder about what we mean by convection. So here's a, a movie showing what one of those upward moving uh, parts of the system uh, might look like. This is an isolated um, cumulus, uh, cumulus, deep cumulus cell. It's forming what we call an anvil cloud here. Uh, I don't know how many of you have actually seen an anvil, a real anvil. Well, I'm surprised. Okay, a lot of you have seen an anvil. I, I always wonder whether calling a cloud an anvil is helpful because if nobody's seen an anvil, then it's not very helpful. But um, you might have seen them in the cartoons. As a kid, I remember them being dropped on the Roadrunner. But um, <laughs> how often nowadays you see a real anvil is not so not so frequent. Anyway, there's a beautiful picture. I didn't take it. I wish I had. A beautiful picture from an aircraft uh, of one of these deep convective cells showing a little bit of overshooting tops up here <coughs> and the anvil spreading out underneath the probably the tropopause is right there. And lots of shallow clouds hanging around uh, in the lower part. Okay, so um, we can ask what, what looks, that's what this thing looks like because all we're looking at is the cloud, the droplets of water. We'd like to know what's going on. <laughs> and the traditional picture, which, sorry, my red X shouldn't be there yet, but um, the traditional picture is just upward moving air, okay, in this cloud, and then spreading out, up, up and out. But um, we've known for a long time, since 1969, uh, that this isn't, that this is too simple. That in fact, uh, there's overturning motions within these things. So even though the, the broad scale convection involves upward motion in this cloud and downward motion, when you zoom in, you start seeing a lot more stuff happening. And so, for example, uh, in a squall line, which is something that Todd will probably talk more about, you have a, uh, a gust front, you have a preferred direction of propagation, you have an anvil spreading out, but you also have this cumulus updraft and then a downdraft. And the, the downdraft has a rain shaft inside, and raindrops are falling in here, evaporating, cooling the air, making it heavy, and it splashes down on the surface and spreads out. Okay, this is just another picture sort of showing the same thing uh, and pointing out what happens to this air. So you get air from the middle of the troposphere which can be cooled by the rain and, and pulled down. So we need to think about conve uh, deep convection um, in a bit more complicated way than just the upward part of a, of a cell. Also, uh, the convection has, is there a clock in the, ah, there we go. I have until, when do I stop, 11? 
Wow, okay. I might be done before then. Um, <coughs> we were talking too fast. Uh, so the other complication that we have to worry about is that there's a life cycle of convective systems. So um, I showed you before that sort of you can have this shallow convection that's just there. Uh, this can develop into uh, what we call a, a, a cumulus congestus or a towering cumulus. And if that continues to grow, typically if it, if it reaches very far above the freezing level, it will often then grow into a full-blown um, thunderstorm or cumulonimbus. And then finally, you'll get a dissipation stage where you still have the deep clouds. Uh, and so from a satellite, it's not always easy to distinguish between this and this, uh, at least not from, well, it, it, it can be done, but it's not obvious. Uh, but you have this dissipating stage where it's still raining. And so in this case, we would call this stratiform precipitation. We would call this convective precipitation, the rain that's coming out of, of this uh, downshaft here, or out of this convective cell. And the, the flow is quite complicated. If we average, I, I like the way this picture has been drawn. This is from UCAR. Uh, there's a few educational sites on the web now that are very interesting. Uh, NASA has one, UCAR has one. Um, I grabbed a couple of figures from those. If you, average, if you look at these arrows, there's five going up and four going down. I don't know if they did that on purpose, but I like that because it's, it roughly captures what's going on. The, the net upward motion in this storm is the residual of, a, of several times more upward and downward mass fluxes in different directions that vary with the life cycle of the storm. So you start <coughs> up with low level upward motion and you end up with upper level upward motion. And actually sink mesoscale downdraft here. Uh, and here we have convective up and downdraft. And if you, if you look at these three um, things, they might remind you of this picture. So it turns out that if you look at a cross section through a squall line, you see something that's very similar to the three convective life cycle stages of an air mass, of a non-organized air mass thunderstorm. It almost looks like you see the young, it's like you have a family of the kid and the, and the adult and the grandparent all moving along together through, through the tropics of the squall line. Okay, and, um, and typically the size of this thing is, it would fit into the grid box of most uh, climate model, atmosphere models. So I'm now saying, getting over to the topic of what do you do in a model to represent this. In a climate model, you, you would have all of this thing happening in one grid box at the same time, typically. And, uh, and so there's been a tendency to write convective representations so that they, based on a, a mixture of all these stages, all these life cycles, or, or a mixture of all these. But I think that's been a problem, and I'll, I'll come back to that later. I think that uh, in, we're, we're now recognizing that in writing convective schemes for models, we need to uh, pay close attention to the fact that you might, your situation might be dominated by this, and it might later be dominated by that. And if you assume that it always has some mixture of these, uh, you're, you're going to get problems, like uh, your diurnal cycle happening three hours too soon over land and, and other more serious problems. Speaking of which, um, these stages tend to occur at certain <coughs> times, preferentially certain times of day on continents because of the fact that the sun comes out and heats the, the ground and destabilizes the atmosphere during the morning. And so you tend to get this in the late morning and by the early afternoon you've got to this stage and by the, late by the evening you've got to that stage. Typically, not always, um, but uh, a lot of the time. Over the ocean, you don't see any, it varies depending on where you are, and it, there often isn't much of a heating cycle because when the sun lands on the ocean, it doesn't heat up very much. So it tends to be dominated more by what's happening somewhere else and the waves that arrive at that particular place over the ocean. But on land, you do tend to get this, this diurnal cycle. This is just a radar uh, image. I grabbed a few days ago, uh, we just had a big storm in Sydney and it probably then, uh, you guys probably got some of it too. And, uh, and this is just to make the point that um, subtropical and mid-latitude storms obviously have convection in them too. Um, we're this is a tropical meteorology meeting, but if you zoom in on these things, you'll see convective cells. So all of the uh, 
storm systems that you would classically understand as a large scale flow. Uh, will have, including cyclones, I don't know if Liz mentioned the convective cells in, in cyclones, but uh, they're also thought to be important for, um, people are starting to look at the dynamics of, of convective cells and how they influence the evolution of, of tropical cyclones as well. Okay, so that's what we see in the atmosphere. Then I guess the, the next thing I, I wanted to move on to is um, how do we understand this? What are the theories or models that we would use to, to explain this? And it, it starts with understanding uh, the basics of gas thermodynamics, which is that if you mix air, and convection is all about mixing, it means that you're taking air and moving it through lower or higher pressures. And when you change the pressure on a gas, it expands and contracts. It changes its volume, and it changes its temperature. So uh, if you take air from near the surface at 30 degrees, and you lift it up, you would typically drop, well, you would drop by 10 degrees for every kilometer that you go up. So by the time you're 2,000 meters up, you're already down to 10 degrees. So that's a big change. So we need to start by understanding that, and that gives us a, what's called a lapse rate. The lapse rate is what we call the, the decrease in temperature with altitude. And the dry adiabatic lapse rate is uh, 9.8, or roughly 10 degrees per, per kilometer. So if you happen to see in, a, in, a, in your environment, if you measure, and you happen to find that the last rate is bigger than that, it would mean that a parcel of air that were um, lifted up or that rose up would find itself slightly warmer <coughs> than the air around it that was already there. And so it would, want to, it would be buoyant and it would keep rising. So you would have what we would call an absolutely unstable, convectively unstable situation. Um, Absolute, because it doesn't even depend on the humidity of the air. It only depends on gas thermodynamics, okay? So you would expect in this situation to see vigorous convection. And I think if you had measured uh, the boundary layer near Sydney when I took off yesterday in my plane, you would have seen something like 11, probably a little bit more than 10. Because there was, there was some nice turbulence going on. Okay? Um, any questions on this before I keep moving? Most of you have probably seen this before. The other, thing, the other ingredient to understanding is uh, knowing that water vapor uh, in, a, in an isolated system will reach uh, an equilibrium concentration in the atmosphere, which we call the saturation vapor concentration, or saturation vapor partial pressure, which is what's shown here. Uh, it increases very rapidly with temperature because the warmer the uh, water is, uh, the faster the molecules are moving and the more they want to escape and be free and be in the vapor phase. And so uh, as you warm up the system, you'll find more and more of the molecules leaving the liquid and ice phases and going into vapor, as shown there. So if we start off with some air that's at a kind of tropical temperature and at a relative humidity of, of about 80%, so the relative humidity would be the ratio of this distance to that, uh, and then we um, start lifting that air upward, its temperature will drop because of what we just saw before. Uh, it's, um, because this is vapor pressure, it's, it's vapor pressure will also decrease in proportion to the total pressure, but at mo a very slow rate compared to this. So basically, once it's been lifted by about half a kilometer, uh, it, it's that its true vapor pressure will become uh, equal to the saturation vapor pressure. In other words, its relative humidity will go up from 80% to 100%, and that's when it will start to form clouds. And if you continue lifting this air, it can't um, supersaturate normally because there's, uh, the water would condense almost immediately. And so instead, it, it follows a trajectory like that where its uh, vapor pressure starts decreasing and the, the uh, difference there goes into condensation. So it starts forming condensation and uh, its uh, saturation vapor pressure uh, slowly it, it follows that curve. Okay, and, and when water condenses, it releases latent heat. So as a result, once the air is on this trajectory, <coughs> it's not cooling off at 9.8 degrees per kilometer anymore because every time it tries to cool off, condensation happens, releases heat, and um, undoes some of the cooling or fights against the cooling. So instead, you might get 
something closer to six degrees of temperature decrease for plumbing. And uh, very often, in fact, most of the time, uh, you see a, last, a true last rate that is steeper than that, but shallower than the dry one. So it's in between. And then um, you can't exactly say whether the air is unstable or not, <coughs> but we would say it's conditionally unstable <coughs> because if the air has enough humidity in it, excuse me, <coughs> uh, you'll have instability. Can I drink this? There's, a, there's lots of sick people at this point. Mm. You're right, it does. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so now that we know that, now that we know what happens to air when it moves up or down, we can calculate something called K. And there's lots of things you could calculate, but this is the one that I think is the, the most basic and important. It's uh, if you if you take a trajectory that an air parcel would follow, so this is 10 degrees <coughs> longer, and then something less, which depends on the water vapor. Uh, with, with temperature going to the right and altitude going up. Ooh, I'm losing my laser here. Um, the air would follow this cur uh, the, the red and then the green line, whereas what is there in the environment is shown by the black line. And because the green one is to the right, it means that the air, once the air parcel reaches here, it wants to keep moving. So um, you have to get it somehow over this potential barrier. And this is, this is often the case that you have a well-mixed layer here, then you have a barrier, then you have a region where once the air moves that high, it, it, just, it will keep moving. And the area under here is theoretically the amount of energy that could be released, because this is a thermodynamic diagram here, um, that could be released per, per unit mass of air that moves up. So we call it the convective available potential energy. Whether this would actually be realized as um, Kinetic energy uh, is debatable, uh, but if it were, then you'd have a vertical velocity that would go at the square root of the k times 2. Okay. Um, and that turns out to be vertical velocities that are often of the order of 100 meters per second, which is close to the very largest vertical velocity that you would ever see, and very only very rarely in, in a thunderstorm. So this is, this is a kind of starting point for understanding uh, deep convection because you, you need the, you need some case to have deep convection. You need for this green line to be to the right of the black line. And it usually is. Um, and and where, where this curve sits depends on the low level temperature and also on the humidity, which is not shown on here. But the more humid the air is in the surface, the more unstable the system, the, the system will be. The other thing that you might need, though, is something to come along and kick the air from there over that central so, for example, uh, um, uh, cold air outflows, uh, gust fronts, uh, other kinds of fronts, um, topography, all of these things uh, will enable the convection to get going. Okay, and um, Cape, or an, an argument like this, also explains why you have these downdrafts, because once the uh, once water particles start falling into the air and start evaporating, uh, that evaporation will cool the air and the air will sink, and then if there's more rain there, that will evaporate. And the process will work exactly in the other direction, and you can get a draft that goes all the way down to the surface. Okay. So, so what we've got here is a situation where because of the water vapor, air can get from the surface to the upper troposphere, even though the the stratification of the atmosphere almost everywhere is stable. So this is why you can have waves. All the people that are telling you about things like Rossi waves and MJOs and uh, I don't know what else you've heard about um, at this week because I wasn't here the whole week. But all of that depends on the stable stratification. Uh, you don't get a wave if every, every time the air moves up, it just keeps moving up. It needs to be able to, you need to want to have a restoring force. And the reason we have this restoring force is because there's only a very small area where uh, this potential barrier is overcome and you get this overturning. Okay. And um, let's see, whoops. I don't know if this movie is going to play or not. Uh, this is a, if it plays, this is a, a high resolution simulation. Um, I know it has played for me before. What's going on? Let's see if that does it. 
The problem is, ah, there we go, okay. So on the left is, this is done by Marat Krutinov in New York. Uh, it's a 2,000 by 2,000 by 500 simulation over the ocean. These, this is the cloud starting from nothing, evolving uh, shallow clouds, which are gradually um, aggregating. And then this is the rain, so there's now rain coming out of the clouds. And over here is the low level humidity, which looks kind of nauseating. But um, what it's showing you is that every time we every have rain, you have these downdrafts coming down, which are cold and relatively um, dry and are spreading out. And the air is spreading out, it's starting out white, and then it's gradually becoming darker as it picks up water vapor from the surface. And finally, when it becomes very humid, that's where you can expect uh, the next system to break out. Okay, so it, and, and also what you can see carefully here is that on the edges of these cold pools, you see uh, right here, for example, clouds being um, pushed upward. So it's showing the importance of boundary layer processes and flows in helping to trigger the development of, of some convection. And it's, it's also showing that we can do pretty amazing things with computer simulations of cloud systems. At least it looks good, I don't know. Who knows if it's doing exactly what the clouds would have done with those conditions. So sometimes this can come from the, the outflow of, of a storm itself. And, and dealing with how these things are all connected is something that, from a theoretical framework, we're still struggling with, I would say. So we need to develop models of convection, particularly to put into atmosphere models, global atmosphere models, for example. And traditionally, they were based on simple plumes, like the ones that, that we were looking at in, in this picture, where you have air that starts here and goes up. Uh, and and this tends to predict that you, you will have deep convection all the time, even though we don't see that. So, um, and, and the goal of these models, by the way, is to predict the vertical transport of heat, vapor, uh, trace gases, aerosols, all these things. So that's what we want to be able to do. Uh, but we know that the simple plume model has some problems, and one of those problems is that, in fact, um, a lot, when you see clouds, they tend to look really turbulent and not much like a, a simple upward plume. And they also mix a lot. So, uh, oh gosh, I just realized I passed. Wait a minute, I just think I passed it yet. Okay. Did I? Did I show a slide with theta E and forget to say anything about it? Where did that go? Ah, did I show the. Did I go past that? I must have gone past that slide without even realizing. I was going to talk about this. This is important. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, just thinking, what the hell happened? Okay, so uh, anyway, th this is comparing. Um, if you want to build a model of convection, you need to start with uh, what, what we typically do is we, we base this on the adiabatic invariance. And the simplest one is theta. Have you seen theta already this week? No? Okay, well, um, potential temperature. I, I couldn't imagine Michael would give a lecture without mentioning ancient history. Okay, good, all right. That was three days ago, ancient history. Um, that's okay. So potential temperature is an adiabatic invariant without any water vapor condensation. So if you take uh, an air parcel and change its pressure, its temperature will change in such a way that that thing there doesn't change. So if we can measure that in one place, we know it'll be the same when we move the air somewhere else. And um, that's useful for doing calculations. But it doesn't work if you have condensation, but we can define another one called the equivalent potential temperature of theta E, which um, is this, is approximately this multiplied by that extra term. That's only a very approximate. If you want to know it exactly, you need some horrible formula. I'm not going to show it to you. And um, when we're looking at what, if, if you're trying to calculate K, what you're essentially doing is you're comparing the theta E of air at low levels and at high levels because that's telling you where the temperature will be higher or whether the air will arrive at a higher temperature or a lower temperature than the air around it. Okay, so uh, to calculate the moist adiabats that were shown in these diagrams, you need to do a thermodynamic calculation where uh, you take account the changes of water vapor and any given change in mixing ratio causes a release of latent heat, which in proportion to the latent heat of fusion you know that um, 
the mixing ratio is, I'm sorry, this is, this is heat here. Uh, DQ is the change of heat, DR is the change of mixing ratio of water vapor, and um, this should be R, not Q. I just noticed that. So by taking into account that every time the um, temperature changes, R changes, and every time R changes, heat is added, and keeping track of that, you can derive an adiabatic invariant theta E, which looks a lot more like that. So these, I'm, I'm not spending a whole lot of time on this, but these are the two quantities that you, you really need, because, and the reason we use them is because convection is fast enough that we imagine air motions are approximately adiabatic. So the key constraint that we're always working with is that they're fast enough that there's not enough time for radiation to significant, or other things to significantly add heat to the air during the convective process. That's not exactly true, but it's the approximation we work with. Did I miss this too? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's wrong with me today. So this was just to show that we have, you can have clouds in a stably stratified situation. So if you look carefully here, you'll see what look like waves in this cloud layer. So this is a cloud layer where you can push it up or down and it doesn't become unstable, even though it's saturated. So what that's telling you is that if you measure the temperature profile, in this uh, cloud layer, the fulvent potential, temp potential temperature, theta E, would be increasing with height. Otherwise, it would be becoming convective. So we do get this, particularly in middle and high latitudes. But you can also get it in the tropics at higher altitudes. It's, you need to be at a cold enough temperature where the amounts of water vapor are uh, small enough that, uh, that this term starts to become small and the lap rate starts to become more closer to the dry line. Okay, I'm sorry about skipping all that stuff uh, inadvertently. We've seen this movie. Okay, we've seen this. So getting back to the models, uh, this is a simulation, a cross-section through a simulation of a growing <coughs> cloud. You can see how turbulent it is. And what these authors were pointing out is that if you if you look aloft, you don't see any air that, that got there undiluted from the surface. So what's on the x-axis here is theta E. Again, it's not labeled, but this is theta E. And um, if, an air, if an air parcel from here were lifted up without any dilution, it would wind up, all, it would follow these curves here. And clearly that hasn't happened. All the air that you see is over there. And even if you restrict yourself to the most intense updraft, it does move you a little bit this way. Uh, but you still don't see anything here. So basically, lots and lots of mixing is going on as air moves up. It's not just going up. And one of the um, uh, choices that you have to make at simulating any kind of overturning motion is, is uh, how much non-local transport do you think there is? How often do you think air goes from one place to another without a lot of interaction on the way? And um, we know that not very much does. So, uh, our model for turbulent entrainment is based on laboratory flows like this one where we have a jet and you can see that it's entraining a lot of, uh, of ambient fluid into the turbulent plume and so the turbulent plume is getting bigger and bigger. Turbulence is like cancer, it tends to grow. Once it gets started, it keeps pulling more and more of the environment into it. And so um, we have a, a, a class of cloud models that's sort of inspired by that or imagine that as the, as the air moves upward, it entrains more and more mass in. And that means, of course, that you're implicitly assuming that the cloud is shaped like a shape like that, which actually you don't see very often. Um, and so I think there may be problems with this model too, but it's better than assuming that there's no mix. A third factor is that when you look carefully at clouds, either in observations or simulations, you see thermals. You see these little, little bubbles that move up. Okay, you don't see long, skinny structures. And whether that makes a difference or not is something that lots of us are arguing about. But at least it's something that we observe and that we know is there. And then the last um, step that you could think of in how to model convection is you could dispense with fluids <coughs> entirely and model it statistically as a turbulent, as a fully developed turbulent flow. And this is what's done typically in the boundary layer, where, as you remember, it's more like a dry turbulent layer. And the simplest way to do it is to, is to write down a law that's like a Fickian diffusion law. So you just imagine that things diffuse down the gradient. And there's a diffusion rate, which is 
the key. Then you have to decide what that is, and you might use a, uh, an effective eddy length or something like that. Uh, and you might usually you would have an increase as you get farther away from the surface. And so you could use a model like this, not just for the boundary layer. People are starting to play around with using models like this, even for deep index. And it actually doesn't work so badly. So it turns out that we've been, I think we've been misled uh, in the way we've been thinking about convection for a long time, because we know that case is necessary. People have really been focusing on it, maybe too much. And um, if you look at observations of where it's raining and where convection is happening, it doesn't really, case doesn't really tell you where that's the amount of case doesn't tell you where that's going to happen. Instead, you'd be much better off looking at precipitable water, like this movie that um, we just saw in the last talk. Uh, he was, this is the column average water vapor amount. Where it was orange in those movies, that's where it's going to be rain. Okay? It's wherever you've got a lot of water vapor that you start to have rain. Case, it doesn't really tell you where it's going to rain. But it does tell you how severe the storm might be if it does start raining. So case is a great predictor great predictor for hail, tornado, or somewhat of a good predictor for hail, tornado genesis, and uh, lightning. But it's not uh, a very good predictor for where you're just going to get a storm. So we may have been overemphasizing the, the importance of this in building our understanding and underemphasizing the importance of mixing and ambient humidity. So that's an ongoing research topic. Uh, I'm getting close to the I guess. Uh, I'm not sure this time. Um, okay, if you look at the, getting now to climate, if you look at the tropical atmosphere, uh, <coughs> the black here is the observed temperature variation. The blue is one of those adiabatic curves that I've been showing you before. The red curve is what you would see if you didn't have any convection and you waited until radiation uh, brought the atmosphere to a radiated and you can see that that's extraordinarily different. So what that's telling you is that convection in the atmosphere is strong enough to bring the temperature profile to something that is almost adiabatically neutral. And it's because of this that we've been focusing so much on case. It's very important uh, that the relationship between case and convection is very important for climate, even though it may not be very useful for localized Okay, so there's some interesting questions about um, how convection depends on temperature. And this is a, a movie made by Martin Singh, um, who comes from Melbourne and is coming back to Melbourne early next year, uh, showing the differences between a warm, a medium, and a cool uh, box of convection at radiative convective equilibrium simulated in a biomodel. So in this warm situation, you can see these really tall uh, convective plumes, and they get shorter and, and weaker as you go to the uh, lower SSP. And um, he and Paul Norman came up with a, a really nice explanation for um, why you sometimes get very strong uh, updrafts, increasingly so, in a warmer situation. And this is relevant for um, our predictions of what will happen in climate change. Basically what they showed is that because of all this entrainment, if, if you think all convection doesn't entrain, you would imagine that the case is always going to be very small. Because the convection will always, if there's any significant case, the convection will come along and kill it off. But in fact, we see some case in the atmosphere. And these simulations show more and more case as the atmosphere gets warm. People have been puzzled about this for a long time. But I think they've, they've explained it by arguing that the warmer the uh, air gets, the more water vapor there is, and the more important latent heat becomes, the bigger that latent heat term becomes in that equation I had up there. Um, the more negatively, the, the bigger of a negative impact that mixing has on the development of clouds. So on average, um, it gets tougher and tougher to get a cloud with a lot of turbulence and entrainment going on to grow. And so you need more and more space. That's basically their argument. But when you have that one more case, it means that the occasional lucky cloud that doesn't mix very much will be really, really strong. So in a warmer uh, climate, you'll get more and more of these really, really strong, or the, the, the really strong um, updrafts will become much, much stronger again, uh, because they, um, uh, you're just getting a longer tail of the distribution, <coughs> because the, the bulk of the clouds are being held back by this mixing. 
but not, not the very lucky one. So I think, I think that's an interesting advance, and it's, it's something that's relevant for, um, for the future. So the, something else to know about heat convection is this is a, on the top a map of lightning. And you'll notice that the world's lightning almost all happens on continents. And, and that's telling us something that convection is much stronger on continents. Okay, this, this isn't explained by Singer and Borman's uh, <coughs> theory at all. Why is convection stronger on continents? This has been a, an argument that's been ranging for some time. And uh, I think that the leading idea, well, sorry, the, the lightning is, there's more lightning mainly because updrafts are much stronger on continents than alitas. So the real question is why are the updrafts stronger on continents? And um, one idea is that because it's drier, you have a thicker boundary layer, and this allows um, updrafts to be fatter, just kinematically, and helps to protect them from the mixing so they can be stronger. So they're more likely to be those lucky ones that we just saw. Uh, I think it's more likely that it's got to do with the heterogeneity of the land surface helping to trigger convection. But this is an ongoing discussion. Um, some, some people have suggested that aerosols on land were driving strong clouds, and I think we know that that's mostly not true, although there's a chance, there's some evidence that aerosols can help a little bit. And there's also some evidence that aerosols can contribute directly to the lightning for a given intensity of the uptrack. <coughs> and the last topic I was going to get to is microphysics. I've got a few minutes left to talk about this. Uh, Brody and Emanuel did a really interesting study um, some years ago where they did a numerical simulation of radio convection equilibrium and they changed the terminal velocity of the drops, uh, which basically is changing their size. And they found that if they assumed that when rain formed, this falls fast, <coughs> they get very narrow, very strong updrafts, and uh, by implication, much higher rain rates uh, at the places where it's raining. Whereas they got the opposite, if they imagined the drops were very small and were, had a terminal velocity that was very small. And I think this surprised people because they expected that this character was governed entirely by fluid dynamics. I mean, we just figured out uh, how to solve the equations of motion. We would, we would understand um, you know, how, how narrow an updraft is and how fast it is. But it's, it's not true. It depends on the microphysics in the cloud. This is just a graph of their results between the terminal velocity and the peak rain rate. So the peak rain rates were going from 5 millimeters per uh, hour all the way out to 25 just by changing the, the terminal velocity of raindrops. And their explanation for this was that if the raindrops are falling faster, uh, basically it means that you're getting rid of the rain more easily, whereas if it stays there, it's heavy and it, and it retards the updraft. Okay. Um, so this is one way that, that microphysics seems to be important. And a related question is why do clouds, why do some clouds rain and some clouds not rain? We see clouds all the time, they're usually not raining. And it turns out that for them to rain also depends on the size of, of the droplets that are at hand. So let me see, what, uh, this, okay, so let me show you this. This is um, just comparing the sizes of different particles that you see. The, the raindrop is down here on the bottom, a two millimeter droplet like that. Uh, a raindrop, this would be a, something that's barely a raindrop. This is a, cloud, a large cloud droplet and a, and a more typical cloud droplet. And there's an aerosol particle coming straight to nuclear. So um, what you start off with is a bunch of these near the surface. And uh, they can quickly grow into small cloud droplets like that by vapor diffusion. Okay, and that's a very sudden process. Uh, I probably don't have time to explain this, but because of the role of, of surface tension in inhibiting the growth of drops when they're small, but then when they finally get a certain size, they're happy to grow. So they grow to this. But that's not big enough to make them rain. They don't fall fast enough. And it turns out that for reasons we don't completely understand, the diameters have to reach about uh, 30 microns, so about half again bigger than this, before they can efficiently start bumping into each other and forming rain. Once two droplets, uh, come together, they will have a bigger terminal velocity. So they can start to overtake other ones. And once that happens, it, it's a cascade. It, it runs away and then you can suddenly get lots, suddenly you have these and then these, and then these, and you can rain. 
But that doesn't happen if you have too many of these, or if they're too small. So if your clouds don't grow very deep, the droplets don't, basically don't get big enough to remain. And this has caused um, uh, some people to suggest that aerosols can inhibit rain. Um, and, and in some situations, they probably can. Uh, a complication, though, is that, again, the entrainment of air leads to really big variations in what you find in the cloud. So it's an oversimplification to imagine that every gulf is the same size. And once you have big and small ones, they can, that, that really helps the rain process. Because the big ones fall and they collect the little ones and, and get everything going. And uh, this, but, but we do know that in some situations, the aerosol matters. And it leads to this really weird um, behavior that you can see over the oceans, in the cooler, over the cooler oceans where you have these fields of clouds that, that suddenly open up and become mostly clear sky. And it's a transition that seems to be a, a, like a phase change in, in the cloud system. And what happens is, uh, once one of these clouds begins to drizzle, the drizzle can scavenge the aerosols, that can reduce the number of droplets, then the droplets will be bigger, then they rain more easily, and the whole thing um, feeds back on itself until finally you get these things that are drizzling and are and have a lot of cloud-free areas in them. So it's, it's pretty cool. How important this is for aerosol impacts on climate is also being debated. But it's an interesting phenomenon. Most of the rain that we get around here comes, everything I've told you, by the way, ignores ice. This is all for clouds that don't even have ice in them yet. Things get much more complicated when clouds grow tall enough and most of the rain that we get uh, in mid-latitudes, and even most of the rain in the tropics, actually, is from clouds that have glaciated. So they've reached high enough to form ice. And then that, that also provides ways of helping to make the cloud rain. So a lot of the drops that fall on you used to be a frozen particle when it was high up in the air, and you could melt it on the way down. Anybody ever looked out of your airplane window and seen something like that? I hope not. You don't want to see that when you look out of your airplane. It does occasionally happen. This is called aircraft ice. This is a severe case. Alan, this is probably a severe case of aircraft ice. Okay. Um, the reason this happens is because when the water vapor goes above zero, it doesn't necessarily freeze right away. It, it, uh, there are requirements, which I won't go into. Uh, but sometimes you can have the water hanging around for a very long time <coughs> without freezing. And uh, one of the things that will freeze it is when it hits an aircraft wing. So this is something that air, aircraft um, companies worry about a lot. And I'll skip that. And skip. There's this is just showing all the extra things happening with frozen um, ice. Uh, if you don't want hail around, you could try building yourself one of these and, and blasting shockwaves to try to break up the hail particle. They don't seem to really work. But people have been trying to use uh, some of the uh, perhaps imperfect understanding of microphysics and the role of aerosols. Uh, to modify clouds for a long time, usually just because they want to make it just rain more, but you can also try to disrupt hail. And I've got only a couple minutes, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how we observe clouds. And I was going to focus mainly on remote sensing measurements. You can fly through these things, but uh, some of the really intense systems that we love to study are not very nice to fly in. You, you land your plane and you have dimples in the fuselage like this, and the hailstones that hit it. So you don't want to do that. Um, but from a safe distance, you can um, use radar. And so here's what the in innards of, of that system <coughs> might look like, uh, where you're looking at the return, but you're looking at the returns off of uh, large, typically large particles. So a radar uses a wavelength, uh, wavelength like this, and it's, uh, it goes with radius to the sixth power, so it's really dominated by large things, which tells you if it's raining heavily. Because if something large is sitting there, that means there's a very strong updraft, because otherwise it wouldn't be there. And strong updraft means heavy rain. So it's kind of an indirect way of measuring rain. Uh, if, if you're getting, getting quantitative measurements of rainfall from radars is difficult, and that's the reason. You're not really measuring rain. But one thing that we can do, uh, you, you can um, use the uh, polarization and other uh, types of information from radar to help, and you can distinguish where you have different kinds of hydrometeors, and that's, that's kind of useful to know. And there are other things besides radar that you can use. So in space, we use uh, LIDARs. We look at thermal emission. We look at scattering of visible sunlight. 
and we look at the emission of microwaves. And all of those are measuring 